This interview is a part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's oral history program, Living Legends Collection. There is no original date or identification of the interviewer given in the introduction on this tape. However, accession records state that the original date was July the 17th, 1968, and that the interviewer is Mr. Guy Campbell. The interviewee is Mr. W. W. Keeler, or William W. Keeler, who at the time of this interview was the president and chief executive officer of Phillips Petroleum Company of Bartlesville, Oklahoma. This interview uh, is being re-recorded on December the 5th, 1984, for inclusion in the permanent collections of the oral history program by Judith Michener. Whenever you're ready, now? Okay. We're interviewing W.W. W. Keeler, President and Chief Executive Officer of Phillips Petroleum Company of Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Uh, Mr. Keeler, you were born in Dalhart, Texas. That's right. correct. That's right. And you are now what age? I'm now 60 years old. And you have been with uh, living in Oklahoma for what period of time? Well, actually, my mother and father are both born in the Cherokee Nation. They're close to Bartlesville. And my father was uh, in the cattle business, and also he would, uh, from time to time, uh, go out to the Panhandle of Texas to purchase cattle for others and make a Overland Drive. This was part of the, to the railroads. And uh, he took my mother on one of those trips. It was a long, drawn-out affair because you had to first select the cattle, get enough young stock, you had to brand them, you had to identify them for each group and arrange the, to, to get the people to make the drive. And uh, so I was born out there and I really never lived in, in Delhart, Texas. So actually you... So actually I've lived in Oklahoma with the exception time <laughs> I've been away and working with Phillips or at school all then, my life. Uh, you were talking about the cattle drive. Let's continue that for a moment here. Where did they drive these cattle to? Uh, they had drive them to the Blue Stem country uh, over in, uh, largely in Osage County in northeastern Oklahoma. Uh, it's uh, around Pahuska in that area, between Bartlesville, Pahuska, Ponca City, and through there was the uh, big uh, Blue Stem pasture country for cattle. I was born, incidentally, on the XIT Ranch, which was, the, at that time, the largest ranch in the world. Who owned that ranch? It was owned by an English syndicate, which uh, received uh, seven, uh, ten counties, what it corresponded to ten counties in Texas. That's where the XIT comes from, ten in Texas. Oh. For the, uh, in return, for the... Uh, a building of the capital of the state of Texas, the capital building for the state of Texas, the English syndicate uh, exchanged, uh, received that land in, in lieu of payment. Was this all in the Panhandle? This is all in the Panhandle, yes. Uh, what, with ten counties, that really covers it's almost all It's seven and a half million land. acres is what it was. Pretty good size ranch. Pretty good size <laughs> ranch. Uh, what happened to this ranch? Uh, it was, how did it, it was, broken up? It was ultimately broken up into, uh, I think there's now some uh, 46 ranches that, uh, that now in the broken up uh, status. Was it sold off or did the government break it up? Or? No, no, it was, uh, it was uh, broken up as a, the syndicate at first uh, began to selling off parcels of land. The syndicate was broken up. And then uh, I understand that the uh, some of the owners of the big blocks, when the families uh, no longer had interest in ranching, that they they sold off, and it generally because of the size of the parcels is necessary to to split it up. Were there any the Matador Ranch? We may have heard of the Matador Ranch was the last of the big parcels, going one block. Among the ownerships in the syndicate, are there any names that are would be familiar to the people? No, I believe not. They were all of, uh, all of them largely were English owners, and uh, I did attend uh, one of the uh, Dalhart uh, XIT reunions, 
and at that time uh, there was discussion of that very subject you talk about and uh, I don't recall any of the names and uh, people uh, uh, that were living here in this country then there were no prominent names that we know of in we'll say in British history like Winston Churchill or somebody of that stature you say the Dalhart reunion is that a uh, it was, an, ex it was an XIT reunion. I think they still have it, yes. And incidentally, at the time I, I attended the reunion, it turned out that there were only two individuals that were born on the ranch that were attending the reunion. There had been a lot of people work there, but there were only two of us at that particular one that were born on the ranch. Well, in driving this herd that your father was putting together when you were born, mm -hmm. did you and your mother make this trip? No, no, we did not. My father uh, made the trip, and we did not. We uh, we came back separately, and the trip was a long trip. Uh, it was one where you couldn't move the cattle very far in one day because you didn't have, well, you didn't have roads uh, as we know them now, nor uh, you have the benefits of fences to, to hold the cattle. And there were, generally those cattle drives were several thousand cattle at a time. Well, in distance from, say, from Dalhart to, say, Pahuska, we're talking about, what, 300 miles? No, we're talking about 400 and I think it's 420 miles uh, by today's roads. How big a herd would he move and how long would it take him to move it? Uh, he'd move, uh, I think, the order of uh, 6,000 cattle at a, at a time, and uh, that would include, uh, they'd also have, from time to time, they'd have some calves drop en route and uh, I, do, I don't really know how long it uh, would take to move them, but I assume it's somewhere around two or three months. Well, when they got to uh, Pahuska, was that where they went to? Well, they would go, uh, they would go, uh, he brings some of them to, uh, to people there. Uh, originally, he was going back and forth between the Cherokee Nation. Now, Pahuska happened to be in the Osage country, but uh, there were, uh, <coughs> there was a, Cherokee Outlet out there, which was west of Pasco on the other side of Osage County, that uh, where the Cherokees had some land and ranching operations, and he would deliver some cattle there. Some of them would come into right around the Pahuska area, and some of them would go uh, uh, east and south of Bartlesville. Who were some of the ranchers around uh, Pahuska and Bartlesville that in the early days? Yes. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Johnstone was uh, one of the prominent ranchers. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mullendore was one of the early ranchers. The Miller uh, brothers. This uh, is the same Mullendores that are. They, they, this is the same now. family, but uh, the original uh, Mullendores, I think, uh, are, are now de de dead. But uh, also, they had the uh, Miller brothers. Uh, over by Ponca City, the 101 ranch later became the, but the Miller brothers and uh, were in business uh, back there. There were uh, the some Tyners, some uh, uh, Hassels. Uh, you may have heard of the Willie Hassel College. Oh uh, yes, uh, that uh, that family. That's H A L S C L L. Yes, and then there was. Uh, uh, Clem Rogers, uh, Will Rogers' father, was uh, was a rancher. Uh, the McSpaddens, the um, Riders, R I D E R S. Then a lot of these people that your father was selling to 60 years ago are still. Yes, the Moors. The incidentally, there are, there are still two of the Moors, uh, descendants of those early ranchers that uh, are still uh, operating. Uh, Clark Moore who has a big ranch uh, around Noora today uh, as just a part of the original ranching operation his father had, and Monster Moore, who has a ranch uh, east of Dewey. And Monster Moore also was, uh, for many years, one of the top uh, raisers of uh, quarter horses, you may know. When you and your mother came back, you know, what town did you settle in? Bartlesville. They uh, they lived actually lived in Bartlesville. Was your father a rancher or was he a cattle buyer? My father was a rancher. He had ranches. 
We had a ranch uh, clo <coughs> at that time. We had a ranch close to what now is Talala, Oklahoma. That's uh, south of Nowara. He had one uh, close to the railroad uh, point at Okisa. And by the way, I happen to have a ranch now. One of my, I have two ranches, and one of them is uh, right in that same general area. And uh, I hadn't even realized my father had a ranch right there overlapping some of this land I bought. Uh, but I, uh, until I checked the abstract and then have uh, found some of those early brands, uh, the branding irons that they used to forge. They didn't, uh, a blacksmith would uh, hammer them out and shape them rather than uh, the way they do now where they uh, form them and then uh, weld them. Then you grew up in Bartlesville. I grew up uh, in Bartlesville to the extent that they could keep me there. <coughs> as much as I could, I was on the ranch. Oh, you out hustling the cattle. That's right. So your early days were spent working cattle. That's right. But then you got involved in the oil business at an early age, didn't you? Well, yes. I went to school in Bartlesville. I went to school. Uh, I started in... Uh, little school that uh, still is in existence in Bartleville, uh, Jefferson School, and then uh, later we moved to another part of town. I went to Horseman School, which just this, uh, this year has been, it was last year, they're discontinuing that school. Went to junior high school and uh, high school in Bartlesville. The high school that I went to is now torn, has been torn down. It's where the uh, present Ritz Apartments are. I was uh, interested. Uh, I had done a little uh, work uh, early at the smelters, zinc smelters that are in the west part of Bartlesville, I, uh, in the laboratories, first as a sample boy and then some of the relatively uh, simpler uh, quantitative analysis tests. And that uh, spurred an interest in uh, wanting to be a maybe a chemist. Uh, I also had, uh, I'd early uh, had a, had gone uh, under the auspices of the YMCA uh, to uh, to a boys uh, evangelistic program uh, and it prompted me also to have a great interest in being uh, maybe a minister. Uh, this was around the age of. This was uh, this was during uh, the the high school years. The high school years, uh, <coughs> the way this thing worked out, I worked in the summer. I managed to uh, do some work uh, with Phillips during the summertime, and um, I became interested then in going into the oil business. But with a chemical engineer's background is what I had in mind. My. Uh, my work there was with uh, largely uh, in laboratories in what what later became the research department of Phillips Petroleum Company. And uh, from that standpoint, we had uh, we had a lot of uh, young fellows uh, that were just out of college. They and their the age gap wasn't uh, so great. But what I I uh, not only learn to have a great regard for them as individuals and their ideas, but also uh, from the standpoint of seeing this as a as a possible future career. The only thing was that I also went to one of the big uh, meetings at the oil meetings they had in Tulsa just about the time I was getting ready to graduate from high school. And I was almost... Uh, almost uh, had to decide uh, whether I was uh, going in the right direction because uh, the authorities, uh, the principal authorities, uh, I should say experts in the oil industry at that time, were predicting that we are going to run out of oil in the next 10 years. And I just wondered whether it would be worth it to spend three, four, five, six years or whatever it would might be in doing uh, work in college and then come out and find out that the industry had literally died right under about the time I was ready to start. Now, I had uh, 
represented uh, our Bartlesville High School in uh, chemistry and in physics and in oratory and had done w real well in all three. And I think that um, the uh, probably from the oratorical side, uh, after this evangelistic uh, meeting I attended, uh, we had a boys uh, a group where we would uh, go and uh, uh, speak at all of the churches uh, around in the city and, and uh, we went elsewhere. We went to Tulsa, we went to Nowata, we went to we had sort of our own little evangelistic team. Uh, I think that that, I don't know whether that uh, came, I think that came first and the oratory second, uh, but uh, that uh, prompted uh, kind of a common interest. By the same token, the work in physics and chemistry was an excellent background for getting into the oil business. And the uh, end of it was that uh, Mr. Harry Sinclair, um, was selecting uh, in Oklahoma, was selecting uh, students for scholarships. And uh, I had received the, uh, I'd been uh, president of my sophomore, junior, and senior class, and uh, president of what was in the student council in the high Y, and some things of that sort, plus. Uh, uh, had won the, uh, we didn't call it a valedictorian, but uh, it would be equivalent to what I think we generally uh, generally recognize a valedictorian. I'd won that, and with that background, my Harry Sinclair selected me as a student from Bartlesville to give this uh, scholarship, and the scholarship was on the basis that if I um, came to work with Sinclair at the conclusion of my college work, then uh, it was a grant. If I didn't, it was, uh, it was a loan at 4% uh, interest. Now, in these days, 4% doesn't sound like very much interest, but I'll tell you, because of uh, uh, the Depression hitting right just about the time that I was uh, uh, my support from Mr. Sinclair ran out from under me when I finally, and I got married, and and uh, when I finally paid that uh, Sinclair loan off, I paid off uh, more money and and interest than I did in the loan itself. Well, you didn't go to work for Mr. Sinclair when I you didn't graduated. go. No, sir, I did not. And why was that? Well, I thought that uh, Mr. Sinclair was. Uh, uh, I just felt I had no obligation to him. I had uh, had uh, some preliminary work. Uh, one of the men who was uh, president of our company, for instance, uh, later, Paul Endicott, was a surveyor in Bartlesville. He's one of the, what I considered a young engineer at that time. I helped him uh, in laying out the present uh, country club uh, at uh, Bartlesville as a chainman and to cut the brush out to run his uh, surveys. The work that I did in the summertime with uh, some of these chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, uh, with that background, uh, I was drawn into, uh, I just felt more that it was a more friendly, friendlier company. So I, you went to work with Phillips in what year? I went to work uh, with Phillips on a steady basis in 1928. Now, who were some of these other than Paul Endicott, that the, the young men that grew up with the company that you started working with? Uh, well, uh, in the company now, there's, there's not a single one uh, that, with exception of T.L. Cubbage, Tom Cubbage, who uh, I worked with in the Burbank field uh, first in 1924. And he's presently vice president in charge of the chemical department of Phillips Petroleum Company. Uh, he is uh, he is the only one of the men who, uh, when I first started work, is still uh, with the company, has not retired. What in the oil business in Oklahoma? What would you say was the one thing that's that's made your company big and successful? Well, I think uh, one of the biggest things that's made it successful is probably 
been the interest in research. Mr. Frank Phillips was a was tremendously interested in research. Uh, I don't know whether you know it, but uh, some of the first so-called, as of that time, uh, stratosphere flying was financed by Mr. Phillips over Bartlesville. That was a work uh, by Wiley Post in a suit that, by the way, didn't look too far different from one of these present astronaut uh, suits that they wear. But uh, uh, that was at a terrific altitude of 20,000 feet, uh, which they had to supply the carburation with uh, air under pressure. The uh, pilot, of course, couldn't uh, operate without uh, uh, oxygen and uh, under those conditions. And um, that was an example. Mr. Phillips uh, had an interest in aviation gasoline that extended uh, the first uh, uh, flight uh, on the part of private individuals uh, to Hawaii from California it was one by uh, uh, Goebel and uh, using a type of fuel that was developed by Phillips, weighed less than other uh, gasoline uh, aviation gasolines as of that day, and therefore he was able to get there a little quicker. Incidentally, you might be interested to know that still later, I was a part of a group that developed at the time that we had the big uh, uh, B-36 bombers, which uh, six engine uh, planes, which uh, would be able to fly all the way to to Moscow and back without refueling. Phillips Petroleum Company was the only company that developed uh, fuel for that that plane. So we've Phillips has been, I think, has been very interested. Boots Adams, who followed Mr. Phillips as leader of the company, had tremendous interest in research. Um, we have had, for instance, in each of the last five years. We've had, a, I think, a unique record in this country because per 1,000 employees, we've had uh, more patents per 1,000 employees than any other industrial company in this country. And uh, uh, I saw research is one thing that uh, prompted uh, my interest in future in oil. Another thing has been that the oil people are a little different kind of people, too, I think. I think that... Um, that there is uh, maybe, uh, I hope I'm not misunderstood, uh, but uh, we really are, are more like uh, Mr. Average Oklahoman, I, I would think, than, than maybe some people who are get involved in, in maybe some other careers. Uh, there's, the oil people are certainly uh, not very formal. They're... Uh, I think they're easy to meet. Uh, the people from other parts of the world that visit here today tell us that they find Oklahoma and oil people both having uh, this kind of characteristic of having some warmth toward the public and people uh, easy to get acquainted with. And, and of course, a, I guess uh, at heart, uh, probably an oil man has to be a little bit of a gambler, too. Uh, otherwise, uh, so... Uh, he doesn't run quickly from odds against him. I think that that has all been a challenge to me. Now, we didn't establish you took a degree in chemical engineering. No, actually, I did not. I did not. I have no degree in chemical engineering. I ended up uh, uh, because of uh, I got married and inability to, uh, when I worked at the Kansas City Refinery and went to school. Kansas University, I couldn't carry a full schedule. It was just a part-time deal. And during the interval, though, I became interested in also mechanical engineering. And I'd made up my mind I was going to get a combined degree. I had enough hours that had they been in the right category in either one of them, I could have had a degree in either way. But there wasn't, I didn't, never did get my degree. After, uh, after my marriage, uh, and the depression became worse instead of better. And uh, I just didn't, uh, I didn't ever finish. I, uh, Carrie, however, uh, I've done some uh, 
I did do some teaching in chemistry and in mathematics when I was in Kansas University. I did uh, some work in uh, when I was a chief process engineer for Philips in their manufacturing operations. I did some work on the development of new processes that, uh, as a result of that, without the benefit of the degree, but because of the work I've done, I'm, I am a uh, professional registered engineer. On speaking of Wiley Post earlier, were there other pilots that worked for you, possibly Billy Parker? Or oh, Sandy yes, Billy people? Parker worked for us, and he had a uh, 1910 pusher that um, he had actually, uh, as that model pusher, so-called model, that he'd built himself. I don't know what year he built it, but he uh, carried, I think, uh, a number 44 as a pilot in the United States, which is a very early number. He's one of the early birds, they call him, and uh, Billy Parker was uh, was the head of our first uh, aviation department. Uh, Mr. Phillips very early had uh, planes when other people didn't have. Uh, it was just thought phenomenal, and instead of taking two days to get into Washington or New York, that you could fly up to Columbus uh, and then not because of the mountains and everything at that point, why Mr. Phillips didn't go over them and then take an overnight plane. We cut it down to one day, why it was a complete well, uh, departure. Well, Mr. Billy Parker was uh, one of the first pilots that we had. And uh, he, of course, is, uh, he was ahead of in our, in our sales department for sales of aviation gasoline and contacts with government on many of these developments. Phillips is, uh, all the way to the solid rocket propellant. We've been involved in some way or other in energy requirements for the Defense Department for many, many years. Well, how old is the Phillips Company? Phillips was uh, organized in 1917 with 27 employees, had $3 million in capital, and uh, of course we've gone quite a bit since then. Well, who were the organizers of the company? The original organizers of the company were Mr. Frank Phillips and Mr. L. E. Phillips. They were brothers, Frank being the oldest. Now, was this in Bartlesville? This was in Bartlesville. <clears throat> is that, at that time, is that where their interests were? In Washington uh, yes. County? And uh, yes. Mr. Mr. Phillips, uh, prior to this time, had been a banker. Uh, the present First National Bank of Bartlesville was a bank that he bought into at a uh, later date. One of my uh, grandfathers was involved in one of the early banks, and that bank was acquired by Mr. Phillips. We were mentioned earlier that uh, you have an Indian background. Could you describe your ancestry for us? As yes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my my ancestor, Indian ancestry is apparently Cherokee, uh, Chickasaw. Uh, generally, uh, because of the, the time I served as principal chief of the uh, Cherokees since uh, 1949, and I'm still serving, although I resigned in 1957. It hasn't been accepted as yet, and I'm continuing until they do get a chief, but. Uh, because of that, I, I, everyone generally assumes that I'm just a Cherokee, but I also have quite a bit of Chickasaw blood. I really don't know how much Indian I have for two reasons. Number one is that uh, I know that both of my grandfathers were white men. Both of my grandfathers lived in the Cherokee Nation by permit because they were married to and Cherokees. Uh, what kind of business and where did they live? Uh, my grandfather uh, Carr, Nelson F. Carr, was the first uh, white man to settle in that part of Oklahoma. He originated in the state of New York. He came to, uh, he had uh, come to uh, Oswego, Kansas. He built a mill race at Oswego, Kansas, and then was post first postmaster at Oswego, and then he came to Bartlesville. He built a mill that he later sold to, to uh, Mr. Bartles who founded the, it was the first postmaster of Bartlesville and founded the little town of Bartlesville. Uh, my grandfather uh, 
had a farm north of Bartlesville that lived in Bartlesville. Then, uh, but he was a white man. My my grandmother on that side uh, was a Rogers. She was the daughter of uh, Hilliard Rogers, and Martha Fields was uh, her mother's name before she was married. The Fields family is quite a quite a prominent uh, Cherokee family that have been, uh, their ancestry can be uh, checked back to about uh, sometime around uh, 1600. It's, uh, they've, uh, and there are a lot of uh, very prominent uh, Cherokees uh, that have stemmed from that family. Now, is that your grandmother Carr? That was my grandmother Carr. She was also of the Rogers family. She was her father, or her mother, was a no she was a cousin to Clem Rogers Mr. Will Rogers uh, a father uh, no. she was also of the Chickasaw extraction uh, there was apparently some difference in the uh, family because I find that Will that have stemmed from that family. Now, is that your grandmother Carr? That was my grandmother Carr. She was also of the Rogers family. She was, her father, or her mother, was a, no, she was a cousin to Clem Rogers, Mr. Will Rogers' uh, uh, father. Uh, no. She was also of the Chickasaw extraction. Uh, there was apparently some difference in the uh, family because I find that Will Rogers was of no Chickasaw extraction, so apparently that uh, it was just on one side of her family. The other, the other family, I did not know my other grandmother. She was a Gillstrap. And uh, before that, her name was carried in, in as a full blood name. and. Uh, I have not been able to check out anything on uh, her ancestry, and it was before the Claims Commission, I mean before the Dawes Commission came around her death, and so we don't really know what uh, uh, what degree of blood she was. Uh, it wasn't uh, the degree of blood, uh, generally speaking, wasn't thought much about it until more recently, and now we just, we haven't been able to get back and find out. Where was uh, this grandmother from? This grandmother was from the Cherokee Nation. Both of them, my grandmother uh, Carr was born on Cowskrin uh, Prairie there by Honey Creek, by Grand Lake. My uh, other grandmother was uh, was born someplace down, I believe, uh, close to the, uh, uh, what's now uh, uh, Benita. Well, from your Indian heritage, uh, have you, was there anything carried on in your family life that yes, when, to the... Yes, well, there wasn't this way that um, my mother had a mastoid operation when I was a little boy, and at that time you couldn't uh, uh, take uh, a mastoid, you didn't have antibiotics and sulfur drugs and many of the miracle drugs that we have now. And as a result, my mother had a long, lingering convalescence of about... Uh, three and a half years. This operation was performed in Kansas City. I went to live with my grandmother. My grandmother uh, talked Cherokee to me at all times, and really my first, it was just at the age I was learning to to speak, uh, and I think it's probably fair to say that uh, my first language is really Cherokee and my second English. My grandmother, um, yes, she had, uh, many characteristics of a lot of our older people who had had problems uh, with government. She believed in that you couldn't trust the white people. And every once in a while, I kind of believe that too, but it's pretty difficult. <laughs> but my mother, when she came back, I went to school. My mother did not want me to grow up as an Indian boy. She had been out of state to school. She found out that there is a difference, and she felt that, uh, that it uh, kind of set us off. When I went to Kansas University, I was very surprised to be 
uh, cold. Uh, I didn't have this office pallor like I do now, and I, I was out in the sun a lot more, and I was pretty dark. And uh, I was called Blanket and Chief, and this is the first time that I realized I was any different than anybody else, because I don't think really in that part of Oklahoma there were so many, all the prominent uh, families in Bartlesville had, there were some Indians somewhere. So. Well, at the university, did you feel discrimination other than these names? Uh, well, actually, actually, I did for the first time. Uh, I'd had people say, uh, how's come that you aren't out there at Haskell with all those other Indians? And uh, it kind of it kind of embarrassed me. And my first reaction was to uh, kind of build up a defense uh, to ignore my ancestry. Um, but I, short after I got thinking about it, the more I thought about it, why then I, I switched around the other way and, and decided that uh, if I was of some Indian extraction, I was going to go ahead and uh, be an Indian. And I, I, activity had prompted me very early to get into Indian work then. Then you indicate, though, that in Oklahoma, this discrimination didn't exist. I don't think it existed at all in anywhere in the Cherokee Nation had uh, 122 schools in the, at the time the Cherokee Nation was dissolved in 1907 when it became a state. And uh, we had a male and female seminary where we were in the curriculum included uh, things like Greek and astronomy, calculus, uh, old classical approach to college education. And frankly, uh, I think that uh, the Cherokee people felt they were a little superior to the people, white people around them, because they uh, they did not have that. We we had started the first newspaper in what's now Oklahoma in 1845. We uh, had now the first long paper. At uh, this Weber, was a Cherokee. Salina. This was a Cherokee Advocate that was printed in Tahlequah. Uh, we had the first long distance telephone system west of the Mississippi. Uh, I mean. Uh, we weren't look. We were looking down rather than looking up, uh, and um, I, I have found that there has been discrimination in Oklahoma, in the western part of the state, and uh, but I don't think really up in uh, our part we we found that in the same way. I, I wasn't aware of it at all. So <clears throat> then later you became the. You were appointed by President Kennedy on a commission to study Indian affairs. I was, yes, I was appointed by President Kennedy to study uh, Indian affairs. I think it was... Um, I believe it was 1963. It was in... Uh, it was in 1961. Then in, uh, I followed that uh, with some work in uh, 19... Uh, I continued work uh, until uh, 1963, part of 63, uh, in connection with Alaska to study the Eskimos and the Aleuts and the Indians up there. Uh, before that time, though, I was already involved in work. I, I was on a commission with the, with the Ford Foundation and uh, the, uh, really the fund of the Republic. Uh, it's a subsidiary of the Ford Foundation. I was, we did work on the rights and liberties of the North American Indian. Our president was a, uh, Mer Dr. Meredith Wilson, who has been president of Oregon University and Minnesota University, and he's now with the Ford Foundation. Uh, Dr. Uh, Carl Llewellyn, who was professor of jurisprudence at Chicago University, uh, Charles Sprague, a former governor of the state of Oregon, and also on the, he was an early UN member, um, Dr. Arthur Schlesinger Sr., uh, who was professor emeritus of history at uh, University of, uh, uh, Harvard University. Well, did these studies involve you with the Oklahoma Indians? They involved me with Indians all over the country. Well, in Oklahoma, what have you found to be the progress of the Indian, recalling your early days until today? Yes. Well, um, 
we I found this that uh, where Indians have had uh, an opportunity, and I'm not talking about being a situation where people discriminated against them, but where they had an opportunity to really get an education, they've done real well, just about like any other. I don't think there were any world beaters, but then they certainly have been able to take their place in society. We had, for instance, on our executive committee, the Phil's Petroleum Company, for before I came on, at one time we had three Cherokees on that executive committee out of seven members, and uh, they were people uh, Cher of Cherokee extraction. Uh, we had uh, people like uh, Will Rogers, who certainly turned the attention of the world to to the Indians. That during his era, we had uh, uh, a Senator Robert Owen, who was uh, chairman of the uh, Finance Committee of the Senate at one time, and uh, that's a rather responsible position. He was. Uh, we had. Uh, Houston B. T. E., who was uh, uh, T. E. Incidentally, means a man killer in in Cherokee, but he was the treasurer of the United States for many, many years there, uh, and was uh, on every dollar bill that we printed for many years. Uh, uh, Cardell Hull, uh, a Secretary of State, was of Cherokee extraction and very proud of it. I didn't, however, know it until very late in his life. Uh, when I was in Washington, I, I found it out. There have been a lot of, a uh, lot of, uh, I'm only saying that those are examples. Now, each tribe had various individuals. Uh, Charlie Curtis uh, is an example. Uh, he was a call Indian. Uh, uh, we had uh, General Tinker. We had, uh, who was an Osage. We had, uh, uh, and among our, uh, militarily, among our own uh, Cherokees, we had uh, a top admiral, uh, Admiral uh, Jocko Clark uh, was uh, one of the top military men. We've had uh, the other Clark who put on the invasion, General Clark who put on the invasion uh, from Northern Africa into uh, Italy. Mark is, Clark. Mark Clark is, uh, is of Cherokee extraction. And my <laughs> point is that, uh, uh, that I think that uh, that people have done well. Uh, I've known uh, people have, uh, all the way from uh, full blood uh, down to quarters that uh, have generally recognized as Indians and and that uh, people who have done well in the jobs that they've uh, taken on. But uh, again, I say a lot of it depends on, on uh, whether they've been oriented to the culture that that they find themselves in. If they haven't, then they've had problems. Back in your early days of schooling, did you go to an Indian school? No, I never did. My mother and father both went to a Quaker Indian school as a Quaker mission for Indian children. They went to as they called a Skatuga <coughs> school. Now we call it Skatuk uh, over here. North of Tulsa. Uh, north of Tulsa. And uh, it was north and east. It wasn't actually where the little town of Skatuk is now, but uh, they had a little... Uh, yeah area there where they had a Quaker, uh, the Quakers had a school, a uh, mission school for, for Indians. And Skytook is a derivation of a Cherokee term, is that it? Skytooga means uh, really little town. Were there Indian schools in your area? Uh, well, <laughs> we considered, uh, we considered Bartlesville uh, being in the, uh, Kui Kui district of the Cherokee Nation. That uh, that was uh, the first schools there. Where most of them were Indian. There were Delawares and uh, Cherokees. Uh, Cherokee tribe had adopted the Delawares. Had been moved into their tribe, and uh, it's just pretty hard to differentiate because almost every family, er early family, with ex few there were few imports, early imports. Like uh, I don't think we had any medical doctors originally among our tribe, or among these tribes. But generally speaking, one well, of the families, uh, even though they might have, there might be some white counterparts, either male or female, a husband or a wife, but uh, they were of Indian extraction. So uh, you say, did I ever attend an Indian school? Yes, I think I did, because the, the great majority of the kids that I enrolled with 
uh, when I first started school where practically every family there. There's uh, some Indian extraction. This man Bartles that you say found in Bartlesville, did you know him? No, I knew his son. Uh, he died, I guess, but, or maybe he didn't die before I was born, but by the time I was old enough to know him, he was dead. So I didn't know him, but I did know Joe Bartles, his son, who was uh, quite an outstanding person. He started the Old Dewey Roundup, one of the first big roundups. It was probably bigger than anything that they've ever had any place at, uh, to start with. It was a, quite, a, quite a show. You mean by Dewey Roundup? Tell me exactly what... I'm talking about... Uh, uh, now they're talking about the so-and-so rodeo. Uh, the Dewey Roundup uh, was the forerunner of that, an idea of, uh, of uh, Joe uh, uh, Bar Bartles, who uh, was actually... He was uh, a... Uh, he would start the whole show with, uh, with uh, coming out with completely in... in uh, Indian costume. He was uh, actually he was Delaware. And what was this, uh, Mr. Bartles, who founded the town? What was his first name? Uh, Colonel Jacob Bartles, I believe. And was he an Indian? No, he was not. But his uh, wife was uh, a daughter of Chief Journey Cake of the Delaware Indian tribe. How did the Delawares happen to? Well, the Delawares, the, the Delawares originally uh, started up in. Uh, uh, pretty close to the state of Delaware. They were moved first, they moved west uh, out into Ohio, then some of them located finally in Kansas City, Kansas. <clears throat> and the government in the process of opening up Indian Territory after the Civil War, General Stan Wadey, the full blood Cherokee general, the last one to surrender on the south, as a condi condition of surrender, since his uh, contingent hadn't been 100% uh, Cherokees, uh, his division, uh, he uh, had to agree as part that the Cherokees would um, locate uh, friendly Indians in the Cherokee Nation. As a result of that, the uh, Delawares came in. Well, we had historically called the Delawares our grandfathers. Now. I don't know what that means, but uh, I presume it means that we considered them some forerunners to our own group. And uh, we originally had Cherokees that originated really up in that same country. We linguist linguistically, we were the Iroquois in the group. And uh, when the white man found us in the South, uh, the other we didn't we don't speak the same languages that they speak. And uh, from that standpoint. Uh, the uh, Delawares were moved after their move to uh, Kansas. They were finally moved out of there after the Civil War, came in here under this uh, setup, and uh, became and were adopted in completely as uh, part of the Cherokees. Uh, they were they have the same rights as any Cherokee by blood. Then actually, there's no uh, discrimination made between a, a Cherokee or a Delaware. No except that the Delawares had some claims against the government that after 1945, when the Claims Commission was set up and there was the government began to look at all Indian claims, then the Delawares set up an organization. Uh, and uh, here again, that was just as an example, uh, our, one of our very best tax men in our company, tax attorney, was a was a full blood Delaware and very, very capable. And he became head of this business uh, group to pursue their claims. And I think they'll probably win. So to that extent, they're going to be separate. <coughs> but for instance, when we won our claim, uh, the claim that we won was that it, the Delawares had already been included in our tribe as of that time. So they were paid just as all other Cherokees. We don't differentiate them. What area? Do the Delawares? The cut. Delawares largely uh, settled around uh, Dewey and north up to the Kansas line. There's an area that somewhere around uh, 25 miles by uh, extending over to uh, south of Coffeyville. 
about another uh, 20, about a 25 by 20 mile square that they, the Delawares, mostly settled. But just like the Cherokees, they, they moved around uh, after allotment. They were given a uh, chance to, to get the land when the Cherokee Nation was broken up, and they, they were broken up in individual allotments. Some of the Delawares chose to, to locate out of that area. So there are Delawares down in the area, of, down around Tahlequah and through there. Are there still descendants of Bartles in Bartlesville? Uh, no, no descendants of uh, Bartles directly, but they're descendants of uh, the Journey Cake family. And uh, uh, William Johnstone, one of the early uh, clerks in the uh, Bartles store, and also later a partner with uh, my grandfather Keeler, George B. Keeler, where uh, uh, he married a Journey Cake and uh, journey cakes uh, were uh, the where they tied in with the Bartles that way. The male side uh, ended with uh, Joe Bartles. Who are some of the prominent families in Bartlesville who are of Indian extraction? Well, for instance, uh, the Howard Cannon family is uh, uh, she, uh, Mrs. Cannon, came from the journey cake family. Uh, Leo Johnstone, who is now vice chairman of the Phillips Operating Committee, uh, young, uh, fair, uh, younger uh, than I am, uh, he's a chemical engineer by training. He's uh, uh, his family, the Johnstone family, and he's uh, about one of the last of the Johnstones still living in Bartlesville. Uh, and I'm talking, trying to size it up from that standpoint. Now we have uh, we had Frank Muskrat, uh, who was. Uh, uh, he was prominent uh, up there in Bartlesville with his work, uh, work for Phillips, but he also was prominent as uh, one of the early uh, early uh, Cherokee uh, leader families because he came from this same Fields family that I'm talking about that I stem from. Uh, I had on my side, just as Frank did, I had uh, a, Cher a Cherokee chief uh, that were in the group that migrated to Texas, a Cherokee chief that migrated to Arkansas before the Trail of Tears, and then back to a Cherokee chief who was back before the Trail of Tears in the east. Now, those families, uh, uh, some of those families are, uh, uh, they've intermarried to the point that uh, it's pretty hard to uh, to, to size them up, the Hall family, who were, were been in jewelry business, but now they're getting ready to retire. Uh, she came from, she's a half, uh, half Cherokee, uh, Mrs. Hall. Uh, uh, what was her name, do you know? Uh, yes, uh, originally her name was Lanham. Is that a Bartlesville family? Yes, it's a Bartlesville family. Uh, Mrs. Robinson. Uh, Mrs. Hackworth uh, is a Cherokee, uh, uh, a white turkey family. Uh, the, um, well, there's quite, I, I just, uh, I, I think it, I could probably tell you that uh, it'd be easier to tell you who doesn't have some Indian blood up there. <laughs> <laughs> then Bartlesville, Despite the fact that the Indian has been assimilated into the community and, and mixed to this point, do the Indians have an affinity for each other that puts them apart? Well, I think I think we do. Uh, uh, we know we're honest. We're not sure about the other people, <laughs> and uh, I think that there's uh, there's some things that we we believe in that uh, that. A little, little bit different. From a cultural standpoint, I think that the Indian has always had more regard for an individual than the white people have. Uh, I think from that standpoint, uh, we look at a person for what he is uh, and not uh, necessarily from the dollar uh, viewpoint. Does this, do you think this is still carrying down into the younger generations? Well, uh, there's been a uh, revival, a revival of, uh, of uh, Indian uh, culture and interest in Indian things. One of, we uh, formed the, I, 
I was instrumental in getting up the Cherokee Foundation, and we've been in, uh, pursuing that. And young people now are becoming interested in finding out things that they never even realized, and they're becoming proud of it and, and showing a lot of interest. What do you think has set Oklahoma apart from other states such as New Mexico, South Dakota, Utah, in accepting and assimilating the Indian into the culture just uh, as part of the communities? Well, I think one of the biggest things, and you have to realize this, that first the War Department had the Indian. Then the, uh, uh, after that, the Department of Interior. And there's a uh, hundred and some years of, sp of time that the government has had the Indian. And during most of this time, it was first to hold him in abeyance so that he wouldn't start trouble. Second, it was as a custodian of his property. That's where the great white father part comes in. And the Indians that were on reservation, it was very easy for the government to uh, conduct this situation with regard to uh, the uh, uh, custodian effect of looking after their property. But with when the five civilized tribes, the nation, these five civilized tribes were all broken up by the government. When that, when that happened and Oklahoma became a state, then each, Indi each Indian, each Indian, uh, it was harder for government to, to look after them, and it was easier, on the other hand, for them to become assimilated. And up until just recently, there's been no effort. I think this is one thing, if I've ever done anything, it's been to try to implement what President Kennedy wanted to do, was develop uh, a Bureau of Indian Affairs that would develop the human resource, rather than just being a custodian. And I think there is a change. There's a tremendous change going on right now, all over. Not just, we're seeing reservation tribes that are doing things now that that 25 years ago you'd say that they, it could never happen. Well, how long has it been since Oklahoma had reservations? Well, there's still some reservations as such in the western part of the state. In what areas is this? Well, out of the Anadarko uh, office, uh, there's, uh, there's some Cheyennes, there's some uh, Pawnees, the Osage, uh, uh, Osages are still considered as having a reservation, although that's dra gradually drifting out. The, the Pawnees, the Kaws, the Otos, the uh, number of those tribes still have reservations. And I think that real difference is the fact that uh, government just can't look after individuals uh, as such. They, uh, uh, the, as well as uh, people can look after themselves if they're standing on their own feet. I think that's the real crux of it. And you see the, the tribes on the east side of the state that, that when they became uh, separated and, and, and they've gone, they've retained, now they're, they've gone back and retained their cultural values as Indians. But they've also become just like everybody else. They live in the house next door or three doors down the street. And uh, they're, uh, they've had to stand on their own feet. They've sent their children to school. They have all the same ambitions that almost anyone has of doing this or doing that. And, and uh, from that standpoint, I think that the big difference is that it has not been possible for government to impose themselves in the same manner as they did on the reservation where they were all collected, all subject to a to a localized control without any uh, threads of, of lines of, of uh, cross linkage with uh, other culture. <coughs> well, then the big job left is in the western part of the state. I think the big job left. There's still a lot of work in the eastern part of the state. There were areas in the east where the following the uh, when the government stepped in with and the the uh, five civilized tribe schools were shut down and became government government tried to take the indian away to from the family with the thought that that was going to bring them around to the white culture sooner well actually it did a very bad thing because it discouraged uh, many of the indian children wouldn't stay in school and there were not truant officers the other thing those that stayed 
when they came home, why they told their parents that they'd been taught that the old way was, there was no uh, things of benefit. They must turn their back, and they, the old people began to uh, rebel against education. And we have some bracket. We have a bracket of age in there where some of our Indian people in the East do not have an education. So there are problems. Talk about schools that they took the children away to, uh, you mean like Shilako or... Shilako or Bacon. Uh, uh, Bacon could be one, although Bacon was a church school. There's Carlisle. There was uh, Haskell. Uh, Haskell. There was uh, Jones Academy. There was uh, a whole lot of different schools that were set up, and they were mainly trying to think that if we can get the full by the way, why? And the theory uh, sounds well, but it just didn't work. They were actually just breaking up the family. They were breaking <coughs> up the family, and they were taking the roots away from, the, and and those people, some of them, uh, are the problems that we have today. The older people. Some of those older people that didn't get the chance to education, as long as there was a business of cutting ties, they had a way to survive and stand on their own feet. But when they, that business uh, began to go out, why then there was no longer anything for them to do. What areas are we talking well, I'm, about? Uh, in the Cherokee country, we're talking about the areas like uh, Nicot, uh, and that's just uh, short of the Arkansas line over there in the hills, uh, in the Ozark Hills there in eastern Oklahoma. We're talking about uh, places like uh, up at uh, Kenwood. We have uh, some people who were moved out of their original homes when they built Grand Lake, and uh, they were put up there in those Flint Hills. They were farmers. You can't grow, you can't farm in those Flint Hills, and... Uh, uh, that caused problems with some of them, and, and they got back in there. They didn't establish schools. The state didn't, weren't as interested in schools in the early days as, uh, as the Cherokees were. But by the same token, there's other places, uh, other areas where other tribes have some of these same kind of problems. I just couldn't give you all the names, but do there's they a place retain, called... Excuse me. Well, do they retain their part of their original culture? The oh, yeah. people? Yes, they retain uh, some of the original culture. And, uh, of course, now there's being a blend by, uh, we're now trying to implement this basic Legends collection. There is no original date or identification of the interviewer given in the introduction on And, uh, of course, now there's being a blend by uh, we're now trying to implement this basic idea that the things that were good of Indian culture, let us keep those alive. We're trying to implement this basic idea that the things that were good of Indian culture, let us keep those alive, let's sustain them, let's teach them to our children, let's pass them on, because it'll make a better America. culture and uh, of course now there's being a black man that we think and then let's take the things that are the white men that are good and let's uh, let's uh, adapt those let's uh, be like the Japanese and and uh, his idea of the willa uh, being such a strong creed because it can sustain the force against the wind uh, when we find it that way why let's bend with it but don't break what are some of these bits of old culture that you're speaking of? Well, um, they still have, um, for instance, the training of uh, training of children, I think is real important. I think that uh, maybe we, uh, we didn't have a m as much uh, uh, discipline as we should have, but we have to be oriented that way. Um, I had a lot of problems in the uh, University of Kansas. Uh, I had a letter from uh, Dr. Katie up there to my mother saying I was one of the most brilliant young men that he'd ever had in any of his classes. But I just cannot be uh, put in a... Uh, um, to, to work all days in the laboratory, if I could work and do the whole thing, 
in a two weeks of Christmas time and get all of it back. I mean, that's what I wanted to do, but uh, they couldn't believe it could be done. Uh, my point is, though, uh, I think that the 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 uh, idea of encouraging encouraging a youngster as an Indian to develop uh, on his own that he had to develop a relationship that he was responsible only to the Great Spirit, and he had to develop this. He had to learn to to survive. He had to learn to track. He had. To, there were many things that, from that standpoint, it's it's beside the point now. I mean. I can smell snakes, snakes yet, and I think that's a carryover of the, something that uh, the Cherokees used to use their nose more than than white people do. Uh, uh, there's uh, some things that uh, that Indian people will notice that, that most white people won't notice. Uh, to me, it's been an added advantage, I think, because a lot of times I see reactions of people that some people don't see in business. Uh, observation. Uh, uh, as a to try to develop the the observation of everything around you, uh, the idea of uh, of uh, for instance our uh, conservation program. The Indian was really the first conservationist. He did a far better job of. He only he only killed what he needed for food. Uh, on the other side of the house, why we killed as long as there were shells left. You know. Uh, from the standpoint of uh, the the idea of pollution of the stream was uh, uh, is just fundamentally uh, real upsetting to an Indian. To to um, and and yet uh, as an oil company executive, I've seen uh, I think it's been responsible for the great interest I've had. And uh, I I started uh, when I got a certain point. Uh, I put in, I encouraged a bill to be put in the Oklahoma legislature to, uh, on a conservation program for streams, for instance, for non-pollution of streams by saltwater by oil companies, that the oil company said, and even the head of our production department said, that it'd break all the ever oil company. Well, it hasn't at all. I, now, I think that there are some things that respect for the other fella that the Indian had. And, and that there is a world that we can all live in. I think those things are real important. I think those are cultural values that the Indian had. I think his reckoning of time is important. Here I'm a, I'm one of these so-called executives that uh, uh, I was just telling uh, Jim about uh, flying here the other day. I had uh, a breakfast date at the Pierre Hotel in New York, drove uh, by limousine, took me about an hour out to Newark, uh, take a, a jet up to Montreal, have uh, go to quite a luncheon affair for the Royal Bank of Canada. After that, we met with some people of West Coast Transmission, which is a Canadian outfit, for a discussion. We flew back to St. Louis, met with some of our salespeople in the meeting, and I got back in Bartlesville at uh, 25 minutes of 5 for a meeting there. Well, uh, now, the Indian had a little different sense of timing. Uh, I mean, the, the time wasn't quite as important. And I think that many of our people live on such tight schedules and rat races that they literally destroy themselves. Now, uh, my fight is to, to retain what's really down in me here, which uh, the Indian was, had, a, he had, uh, he had a, he had, he had a little different way of thinking. He, uh, he didn't always think two plus two plus two equals six. Uh, he had more of the intuitive uh, kind of approach to mathematics, even. Uh, he believed that contemplation could, could have its benefits, and I think it can. I think these are some things that if we're able to survive that value, and it isn't overrun with the great press of, like, there are people in our company that have tried every way in the world. Uh, uh, it's surprising that I've reached the, the position of president because I've rebelled against many of those things, just like I rebelled at the University of Kansas. I failed to, to say I went back later, but I failed to say I had one whole semester of nothing but S because I refused to go to school. I thought I was uh, 
retaliation against the university, but it was retaliation against myself, you see. But it was because they told me that I could not, it was impossible for me to, to do uh, certain chemistry work in the fashion I was doing it. But I'll tell you, uh, there's a lot of things that I... Uh, that I've seen, uh, and I think this be, these are advantages in in uh, business in some ways because I don't I think that we don't have to think just long one line, see. And I think we have a tendency we have a tendency in business to think that there's just one way to do something. Well, as you see it now, uh, what is the future of the the Oklahoma Indian? I think the uh, future of the Oklahoma Indian is that uh, uh, regardless of uh, anything, we've never had the same racial problem as the Negro. The Indian actually, the, the Negro feels that he has to be up with the white man to, to do something. The Indian has always felt that he would rather be aloof of the white man and only be with him when he wanted to. And I think from that standpoint, uh, what's happened, really, is that there has been more simulation taking place than we've realized. When you asked me about Indians, and I got to thinking about these families up here in Bartlesville, I, I suddenly realized to find a full blood up there now, uh, I, I'm not sure just who I'd point my finger to, because the, uh, there's been so much intermarriage. Because of education, people are more and more, and, and the state of Oklahoma is on the ball now with an Indian program. I think that this Bureau of Indian Affairs, with their desire to develop the human resource, they're offering opportunities for Indians to do things that, and uh, to be free to, uh, to handle their own affairs and do things just as rapidly as they want to. And from that standpoint, I think that uh, we're going to find that another 25 years that we'll find that that uh, it'll be pretty hard to say other than the the culture like these Indian clubs there's Indian clubs with men there's Indian clubs with women that are still caring for some of these things where we're try keeping alive what we consider some important uh, uh, cultural and the history we we developing pride uh, of our people well, I think we always had it but then a lot of people didn't know a lot about their history. So from that standpoint, I think we're going to find that, that we'll be a part of what it takes uh, this country to be a great country. I think we'll be right in there. In the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, do you think this is good to have an organization that sets the Indian apart as a special project? No, actually, I, well, I'll put it this way, that I think that uh, that there are a lot of times that there are those who encourage that the Indians ought to have something different than all the rest of the people of the United States. I do not believe that's good. Now, I think that there does need to be some group until all the problems are washed out. I think that there needs to be some group who has, we'll say, technical uh, Excellence, and, and not from a political standpoint. Now, some of the early Bureau people were nothing but political uh, political appointees and people that got in there. Uh, there's now being an effort to try to find people that, that uh, oriented to what it takes to develop people. There are educators, there's uh, economists, there's engineers. There's uh, a number of facets that are now being in the Bureau that never existed before. Then one of the major steps from what you said that's uh, needed would be doing away with these reservations in the West. I think that, uh, that a reservation as such uh, has some real problems in Indian. I think if Indians want to live in an area together, <coughs> as a reservation, that's fine. But the way the Bureau originally handled it, if you went away from the reservation, then you were no longer an Indian. And any, any uh, help that the, the Bureau might give an Indian to advance in life. Uh, he he, he uh, sacrificed that. And it was almost a, a fellow, uh, the Indian began to get the idea he had to remain right there, or otherwise uh, he, he was lost. See. Now, actually, the Bureau now, <coughs> they're extending their 
where people are interested, they're going all over, uh, relocating Indians wherever they want to be. And I think that the, you say that the thing to do is do away with them. I think that the move has started. It's existing. Because education, the wars have changed. Uh, many, many Indians uh, uh, have gotten out to, from the reservations, and they, they're different people today. Are you currently serving in a position with the Bureau? Uh, I think, uh, yes, I'm still a consultant to the Secretary of Interior, yeah, Stuart Udall. But uh, other than uh, I have not been consulted in this last uh, a year except on one occasion, and that was uh, in connection with a program for greater participation of uh, industrial groups to go into Indian areas, where there's a dense population of Indians, and to encourage those industries to come in. Now, we've done this in Oklahoma. Uh, for instance, Phillips has a pipe plant up here at Pryor that's, uh, I think, with the exception of one, all of them are Indians. Uh, there's the Bates Company as a textile outfit that we've encouraged to come into Oklahoma, and, and they have all Indian help, practically. We have uh, the McCall people, Starcross, who are are uh, coming into Tahlequah is another example of what I'm talking about. We have uh, a boat manufacturer that we're presently about to build, a candy manufacturer. Uh, uh, I think there's uh, these people uh, like uh, Don Grieve over here at Sequoia Mills. He's done a tremendous job of, uh, of industrialization, of giving opportunities for work for people who maybe had never had a job before. A training program. Uh, I don't know the time would permit it, but there's one little story that I think just uh, it shows an example of what I'm talking about. You think uh, we got the time? Yes. All right, well, here's a, uh, we, we uh, during the war, we were in badly in need of people to take care of our plants. We lost so many people in the draft and during the war and so forth. And from that standpoint, uh, I finally said, well, I know where there's some in, uh, where there are some people. And I went over in the Cherokee country and picked out a bunch of uh, young boys who, or young men, I should say, not young boys, but young men who were, had not been called by the draft yet and uh, who I considered intelligent, but I recognized that their education was very low. They had practically no education. They spoke very little English. We gave them a, we brought them over to Bartlesville. They took a physical examination first, and incidentally, that's their first physical examination. I'm satisfied that scared the heck out of them. Second thing that happened, we gave them a Wonderlick test, which is supposed to be uh, some uh, indication of intelligence. We have in our company, we'd add a, a qualification for a minimum of 17 on this Wonderlick test. They called me and they said, Bill, we're just awfully sorry about those Indian boys here, but said uh, <clears throat> all of them but three got uh, two and uh, three got three. And I said, uh, and they said, we won't be able to hire them. And I said, well, you just have a waiver because I'm, I'm head of the manufacturing department and I need people and I'm putting them on regardless. And uh, so we put them on and... Uh, we now have from that group, we have some of them that are operating some of our most chem uh, complicated chemical plants. And Phillips is a leader in petrochemicals. And these boys have done wonders. I went back later and, and got two of them to take that Wonderlick test later, and both of them uh, got high scores on it. But the difference was that, um, which I don't think most people realize, and I think it's one of our problems with the Negro that's... Uh, the hardcore unemployable that uh, they're living, thinking, uh, their image of themselves is different, and when they get in strange surroundings, they just freeze up. And I think that's what happened with those people. One other story, because I think this is a tremendously interesting point about these people, these Indians, and what they can do. A fella got a job, a contract for three years to coach a football team at an Indian school. At the end of his first year, he lost every game, I understand. 
uh, later he uh, went to live that summer with an Indian family. But before he did, he had written some letters to his friends saying I ought to have my head examined. Well, what happened was that when he went to live with this Indian family, he discovered that there are some things that to the Indian are valuable to them that weren't valuable to him at all, and vice versa. He'd been trying to get them to do the setting up exercises, see. And he said they're lazy, indolent, you can't get them to do a doggone thing, they've got fine physiques, and they just aren't in shape, they'd care less. Well, at the, before the start of the first game, he said, uh, boys, he took them out to the edge of town, and he said, when you've caught four rabbits today, training's over today. Boy, here's the way they went, see. And that team became one of the greatest teams in the nation, and a little 158-pound back, Jim Thorpe, became one of the great football players, and that coach was Pop Warner. Now, Exendine, who's still living, I think he's down here either, in Tul uh, living in Tulsa now, he was captain of that football team. I didn't believe that story at first, but he brought me clippings from Boston papers telling about the, uh, and where they'd uh, followed these Indian kids, and they just became a trip. But they were motivated by something that had value to them. As comparison to this, they couldn't see any value in that. Is there anything that uh, we haven't discussed that you'd like to talk about? Well, uh, not that I know of. I think that the... Uh, I think I've got a great interest in this uh, state of Oklahoma because I think that it's a it's a warm state. I think that people in in uh, other parts of the world are becoming to know Oklahomans. Really, we've got a, a kind of combination of all these uh, things that have been happening in this country. Of Oklahoma, I think has changed our image, and I am anxious to see that uh, we we try the best way we can to maintain. Uh, some bench points, benchmarks back here with the past, because I think that as we do, we'll bring, uh, we'll, uh, we will help a lot of these young people, I believe, uh, have a different attitude about the future. And I'm not talking about just Indians. I, I, I think that, I think we have a chance uh, out here in Oklahoma to do some things, uh, uh, with the from the standpoint of the racial problem that couldn't be done anyplace else. I think that this that the fact that I am an Indian and the viewpoint that Indians have in dealing with others has helped me in my work in Algeria. It's helped me in in Spain. It's helped me in many, many places. And I think part of it stems from the fact that they had a, a, a unique, as a people, they had a unique uh, training to, to uh, uh, respect the other person's uh, uh, viewpoint. And I think that if, uh, th that I'm in hopes that, that, uh, that educational programs will take more interest in the Indians because those things that are good, I would hope that would become uh, usable by posterity and that uh, this part of the country will, I think, going to just flourish tremendously, and it's going to flourish with a bunch of people that, if you get right down under and look, there are going to be some people that are just like myself, have been of some Indian extraction, and it hasn't hindered. It's really helped. Well, I think that'll about okay. do it. We've talked about an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs>